All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for coming out. Wow, okay, we're packed in. <coughs> I think we're, we're maximum standing room only. Um, this evening, we're going to talk about Lao Tzu and Taoism. <coughs> this is number, what, are we three or four? Three in the ancient series. We did Confucianism last month, and the closely related idea of Taoism is what we want to talk about tonight. Now, I was trying to figure out where to begin, and I decided to begin with the not, because the idea is the Tao which can be spoken is not the eternal Tao, so let's not speak it. How about we'll do that? <laughs> Instead, we'll start with the great what it's not. And so at the beginning, uh, I have some titles from some books. You can get these on Amazon. Change your thought, meditations, do the Tao now. <laughs> not. The Tao of leadership. And no, the Tao of business using ancient Chinese philosophy to survive and prosper in times of crisis. And it's not that either. Some other famous ones, the Tao of physics, no. The dancing Wu Lai master, no. The only thing that quantum mechanics and Taoism have in common is one is complicated mathematics and one is complicated ancient Chinese, which nobody knows. And so you can combine those and make anything you want. <clears throat> but basically, a gross misrepresentation. So it's not any of these things. In fact, in preparing for this, I, I, I was reading many uh, Taoist parables. In fact, I spent a lot of time, just because it's so pleasant, <laughs> reading endless Taoist parables. But I got interested in their interpretation. And one of the things you run into is the almost inevitable incorrect interpretation. And the struggle that we have, I think, with, with some philosophical concepts, there are two kinds, basically, I would say. <clears throat> One kind is that the philosophical concept itself is subtle and difficult and challenging, <clears throat> and so we have a hard time getting our minds around it. Or those can be presented in such a way that it's hard to understand what the philosopher is driving at. See Kant, Emmanuel. Um, or, and I believe this is the case with Taoism and Lao Tzu and uh, Chong Tzu and Li Tzu, that the concepts are actually very simple. They aren't complicated. They are not remote from us or difficult. They just run so counter to what we usually think, how we think about the world, that we can't quite get them in our minds. They seem confusing, they seem odd, they seem evanescent because we just can't quite get at them, not because they're difficult, <clears throat> but because they're just simple, but they run counter to our thinking. And all of these titles that I've read are, are, are examples of this. But the greatest example I could come up with was in Sartre. So I was trying to think what's a really good, clear example of this. And the, and the clearest example I could come up with is this passage from Sartre. And it's not Sartre's, Sartre's fault, by the way. He was not trying to be a Taoist. He was trying to be Sartre. Uh, whether it's good or bad, I don't know. But um, he does, I think, articulate with great clarity why we get Taoism wrong so consistently. <clears throat> he says, if one considers an article of manufacture, as, for example, a book or a paper knife, one sees that it has been made by an artisan who had a conception of it. And he has paid attention equally to the conception of a paper knife and to the pre-existing technique of production, which is part of the conception and is at bottom a formula. Here then we are viewing the world from a technical standpoint, and we can say that production precedes existence. This is the essence of something. The idea of something precedes it coming into being, the existence of something. Right? You can also think of this the world of platonic forms. He's, 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 he's working with the platonic ideas here, is that there's this world of perfect forms that then manifest themselves in the world. The essence, the idea, the totality of something exists before it can come into being in the physical, real, imminent world. <clears throat> here then we are viewing the world, I'm sorry, thus there is no human nature because there is no God. So the problem for existentialism and philosophy at this turning point is, well, if you get rid of God, who's the conceiver? Who's the pre-conceptualizer? The answer is no one. This is the existential crisis. This is the fundamental problem. And he says, uh, because there is no God to have a conception of it, man simply is. Not that he, simply, that he is simply what he conceives himself to be, 
but he is what he wills. And as he conceives himself after already existing, which is to say we exist, and then we have to make up a reason for our existence, which is the other way around from Plato and everything, as he wills to be after the leap towards existence. Man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself. That is the first principle of existentialism. And it is what people call its subjectivity, using the word as a reproach against us. But what do we mean to say by this, but that man is of greater dignity than a stone or a table? Sartre. Now, this is very clearly articulated. In Taoism, however, there is absolutely nothing greater than a stone. <laughs> the whole notion that you could aspire to be greater than a stone is absurd. We will never be as great as stones. I'm not making that up. This is absolutely true and clear throughout every principle of Taoism. The great Chinese text from the 18th century, the story of the stone, as it's called, or the dream of the red chamber, has as its main character a stone. That's, he, the stone drives the plot. This is because the stone is the best possible thing we could hope to be. This is one of our problems. In Taoism, if you want to know an answer to something, you look to nature. The question you ask is, what would a stone do? <laughs> I, I know that sounds funny. It's, I'm not kidding. This is really the idea, and it's why we always get it wrong. We struggle with this. Because we, this, well, we can maybe. We'll talk about if we can know what a stone would want. <clears throat> but, the, but our struggle is we just think that's silly. Sartre just says that. Look, no, look, we're better than stones. And he says earlier in there as well, another fundamental concept that he violates, the Taoists, he says, thus there is no human nature because there is no God to have conception of it. Man simply is. Yes, stop, full, stop. Taoism says, right, done. <laughs> You're finished. And he, he wants to go on. That's not enough. What, in fact, if you look at the title of all these books that I have here, the notion is that the Tao must be instrumental. It's a tool that we use for something else. In fact, everything is a tool that we use for something else. I want to suggest quite strongly that, again, the first principle of Taoism is you look at nature. And in nature, nothing seems to be doing anything else but what it does. Stones are not leveraging their position to make money in the sand market. <laughs> Water is not using its thoughts to meditate now. Trees are not growing with the notion that in some future they will move to Florida and retire quite happily by the coast. It, it's not instrumental. It's not, it's not trying to do this to achieve that. It's not on its way someplace. It just is. It's the great isness of the universe. And we hate this idea. We just have, we can't, because we want it to be for something. We want it, to, but what, it, what the hell is the universe for? An awkwardly large paperweight? Uh, you know, I don't know what, what the universe possibly, I mean, the, and we're always asking, what does it mean? Nothing. What's it for? Nothing. Why does it exist? We don't know for no reason. See, these are all unacceptable answers. We will not, we just say no, 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 you can't say that. You can't say the universe is meaningless. You can't say it has no reason. You can't say it's an awkwardly sized paperweight. You know, it just, we, it must, it must function in some way. And releasing that concept of functionality is hard. And so even while, again, it's a perfectly simple concept, go to nature, look what nature does, do that. I, I think literally thousands of parables poems, lines, tell us this over and over and over again, and we think, right, go to nature, learn something to apply someplace. Like, no, no. It's not, an, it just, no. But we struggle. 
So I thought, so some parables, of course, we have to have our parables because they're so wonderful. Um, uh, one, and now the, this is the picture. This is the picture of the useless tree. And, and this parable comes in several forms. Twonk says in the, his collection originally, but it's, it's, you can find many versions of it. But essentially it boils down to, I just put the picture there. Um, it boils down to a, a woodcutter, often a monk also, but sometimes just a woodcutter, or wandering through a village and there's this old ancient twisted tree that the woodcutter just walks past because it's useless. Doesn't give a second thought to it, so knotted, so pitted, that no one has ever bothered to cut it down because no one has ever been able to figure out what possible use could you have for this old rotten twisted tree. Um, and the idea is, it's useless. This is clearly the multiple repeated versions of they always say, look, this is useless. In some versions, the tree then comes to the man in a dream and says, you say I'm useless like it's a bad thing. <laughs> now, if you look at the interpretation or the reading of this that you'll find in various places, they often will then move on in the, in, in the West, in our tradition, to say, yes, but look how beautiful the tree is. And often the depictions of the tree, we can almost can't help ourselves but make it beautiful. Because we think, oh, it doesn't have a functional utility, it must be beautiful. Now, it, think of an ugly, useless tree. Think of an ugly, annoying, bothersome, horrible, useless tree. It's just not bothersome enough to make you cut it down. But there's no reason to have it there. You know, that, th what we want, we just, we, we take the parable and we, we really want to make it, use it. It's got shade in the summer, the birds like it. No, useless. Just like the universe, it has no use. See, yeah, we can't do it. Uh, another one, <laughs> here, this one is my favorite one, I think, of, of the ones I found. Uh, again, another famous one. Uh, if a man cross a river and an empty boat collides with his worn skiff, even though he be a bad-tempered man, he will not become very angry. But if he sees a man in the boat, he will shout at him to steer clear. If the shout is not heard, he will shout again and yet again and begin cursing. And all because someone is in the boat. Yet if the boat were empty, he would not be shouting and not be angry. If you can empty your own boat crossing the river of the world, no one will oppose you. No one will seek to harm you. Become an empty boat floating aimlessly on the river of life. Now that seems pretty damn simple and clear. Now it could be a horrible idea. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's clear. And yet, you can find many, I would say perhaps even the majority of interpretations in English about this passage, say, see, you shouldn't get angry at empty things. They, they write about the guy yelling. Don't be angry at the empty boat. No, 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 no. Be the empty boat floating aimlessly on the stream of life. Just, just empty yourself out. Then you'll be useless too. <laughs> right? See, you want to be useless. You don't want to prosper and survive in times of crisis, right? That's using ancient Chinese. No, we're not trying to prosper and survive. We're trying to be empty like a stone or like a boat with nobody in it floating aimlessly on light, and then you'll have no troubles. So that image is, it couldn't be any clearer, it's, and it couldn't be any simpler. This is what I, always strikes me, is that, that the, the clarity and the simplicity of the parables um, somehow baffles us, because again, it runs so counter, not because it's complicated, because it runs counter to our thinking. Of course, the great example of this is the Tao Te Ching itself. Now, Tao Te Ching is somewhat subtle and elusive just because it's in the form of a long poem. So it has its poetic issues. And it was written a long time ago in classical Chinese, which is very dense. So I'll, so I'll give it that. Um, by the way, there are hundreds of translations of this text. People love to translate this because it's very short and seems easy. There are not hundreds of translations of the Mahabharata. 
because it's really long and it's in Sanskrit. Uh, and so if no one translates the Mahabharata, everyone translates the Tao Te Ching. So if you're looking for a translation, by the way, I would say just red pines. Just go get red pines. The notes alone are worth the price of admission. It's just a brilliant work of scholarship. Um, but when you read it, you encounter all these ideas that seem odd, but often because we're just not thinking simply. And red Pine <laughs> emphasizes this in his translation. Other people have as well. For instance, the couple of the key terms, Tao, the Tao, uh, is a way or a path or a road. And, and as this evolved in a concept, it took on the larger philosophical meaning to say there is a way in the universe. The universe has sort of a, a rule or a law, or it's like gravity, uh, a field, if you will, that permeates everything. And the way you learn the way is to go into nature, because it is the best unretouched example of the working of the Tao. And if you do that, you will learn, and when you learn, then you'll know. The problem is that what you learn and what you know turns out to be hard to describe and kind of ineffable and not very applicable. <coughs> this is why the, the Taoist masters always wander off and disappear. <laughs> the, the world is called the red dust. It's the place of all the noise and commotion. That's where you get misled. So you can go out and you can look, and what you're going to find, nobody knows. Only you can go and find it. By the way, this is one reason that the path that is a path is no path. Because if, if it's a path, that means somebody else found it, which means you aren't finding it, which means it's not the path, unless it is. That's, your, that's the very helpful <laughs> Taoist process. So again, this is not complicated in the way much philosophy is complicated. It's very simple. It's just hard to get in your mind. If there's a set of rules, if there's some order, if there's some guidelines, they're wrong. We know that by definition. Because the universe doesn't, it has a pattern, it has a way. As soon as you find that, you're in good shape. But what is it? Just be like the universe and you'll be good to go. Um, but that's tricky. And then you have, so you have this whole notion of the path and trying to find the way and connecting with the way. Um, and then you have the day, the day, Dao De Ching, uh, the virtue. But virtue here is a very elusive term. It's been translated all kinds of ways. But one way to think of it is, is sort of uh, the virtue in the sense of what are the virtues of salt and the virtues of a pomegranate and the virtues of banana are different. They have their virtues, but they aren't virtues in the sense of here's a list of rights and wrongs. They're virtues in the sense of uh, being true to themselves. Bananas are virtually always like bananas. Right? They're very banana-like in their characteristics. <laughs> and that, that is the great thing. It really, I know, see, it sounds funny. It sounds stupid. It does. It sounds stupid, but it's not. It's, if, imagine if bananas were not like that. <laughs> imagine if bananas were uh, like humans, like changing all the time, doing crazy shit. We'd drive, we wouldn't, no one would buy bananas. We'd be like, I'm not buying a banana. <laughs> Because you never know what you're going to get when you, you peel that. You, ah, it's a dog. No, I don't want a dog. I want a, See, what, the virtue of the banana is its consistency with itself, with its banana nature. We love that. We absolutely, we don't think about it. We just take it for granted. Uh, unless it's not, right? But when things change and when shift, we go, oh. So it's virtue in the sense of being like itself, being true to itself, being a, 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 a aligned with what is, the isness of things. And so again, we want the moral judgment. We want the yes and no. We want the black and white, the good and evil. And if the Tao says anything, it says, just, just stop. Just no. Just let go of that. It even says, the good creates the evil, the evil creates the good. The Tao is the manifold of all things. It's all part of the universe. By the way, this gets rid of the whole why do good, good bad things happen to good people problem. 
right? Because people say, oh, well, there's this benevolent God. I'm like, man, that benevolent God is drunk because he is paying no attention to what the hell is going on in the world. So you have to do all these theological backflips to try to explain how you have an all-powerful benevolent God and yet some less than benevolent seeming activities. Uh, Taoism has, does not have this problem because the world is like, yeah. They don't say when bad things happen to good people, they say when things happen to things. Processes happen. And Taoism says this is what you need to figure out. That when you're throwing the goods and the bads, so often this just baffles us. It's not helpful to our thinking, to our understanding of the isness of things. And so we struggle with that. Um, and so the Tao Te Ching is really this notion of, of a path that probably isn't a path, and the way that is the universe that we need to respond to, but that there are no rules. By the way, he shares this with Confucianism. Uh, in, in Chuang Tzu's writing, there's, this, I think, as much Confucius as there is uh, Lao Tzu Taoism and Tao Te Ching. You, you know. So Confucianism also uses the Tao all the time. The Confucius response to this idea is completely different than the Taoist response. But they, ha they share this common notion that the universe just is a way, and you have to figure out what that way is and go from there. But it's not a moral way. It's not a way that has meaning. It's not a way that has utility. It doesn't have all of the things that we want to invest meaning with. You know, what is it? Why was it invented? All those questions just should vanish from our thinking. Um, so this, when, you, when you're thinking about Taoism, the Tao Te Ching, you know, this is, the, this is our core struggle. Um, some examples of this, and I, I steal this example, it's such a wonderful one, is they talk about uh, who, who's the good emperor, who's the good leader. Um, the good leader is the leader who absolutely you have never heard of and you don't know what they're doing. Things just happen. Uh, and, and the great example is who, is who manages the sewer system here? I have no idea. Somebody may know. Generally, we don't know and we don't care because the sewer works. The invisible person makes it all happen. We don't want to know. We don't need to know. We're happier not knowing. <laughs> this is the ideal leader. Keep the people ignorant. Keep them fed. That's what you want to do. Very Socratic, actually. Socrates has a fair bit of this, particularly Plato's Republic. Uh, you know, people know things that creates trouble. <laughs> it confuses them. They get hard to rule. They mess themselves up. But we don't need to know how the sewer plant works. We don't want to know where the sewage goes. As long as it goes away, we're happy. The invisible emperor. If the entire state can be run this way, then it's perfect and you have the perfect leader. As soon as you know or think or things aren't working, ooh, you've gone from the path. This is... This, this really, this very strong impulse, the, the, the invisible. It seems odd, it seems weird, but really, who's a sewer manager? I have no idea. I don't want to know. I just want it to work. Like, we don't care about electricity until it goes off. And then we're like, oh, man. If it goes off for six minutes, we're like, the world has come to an end. <laughs> and then it comes back on, and I don't think we ever ask, well, that was great. I wonder what the name is of the person who did that. No, we just think, oh, the world has returned to its right course and we can move on. This, when, so when they talk about this notion of like an invisible emperor, it's these kinds of concepts that, again, seem contrary to what we think of as a leader. A leader is someone who's out front, who's vocal, charismatic, who has ideas and concepts and says things and does things and is active and woo, as opposed to someone who's invisible we've never heard of. I always think it would be hard to recruit people into politics to say, how would you like to be anonymous? <laughs> no discernible power, and the only reason we would ever know about you is if you had messed up. <laughs> See, this is not very attractive. People are like, well, wait a second, I want power and I want some fame and probably some money. So Taoism doesn't offer any of the above. It's like, ooh, see, all that's going to get you in trouble. And so we, we struggle with it. Another key concept that gets brutalized is Wu Wei, which, which, which is often translated as non-action. 
which is okay-ish, but actually the wu there doesn't mean not or no in the sense of anti. It means empty or vacuum or nothing. So it's an action from nothing. And so better ways to translate this, because they all say, oh, this is the paradox of action through non-action. Well, it's not a paradox at all, by the way. If you want water to flow downhill, what do you do? Leave that shit alone, right? Because it's going to flow downhill. This is what water does. It's not, it's not confusing in any way, right? It doesn't throw, if the light is on and we want the light on, we don't think, what should I do? No, we just do nothing and the light's on, which is the way we like it. So one, it's not really paradoxic at all. We do all kinds of things by not doing them. It's really, in fact, think if you had to do everything. It would be very time consuming. Uh, you know, it's, 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 so mostly what we do is not doing things. But what Taoism wants to emphasize is even mostly not doing things is probably too much. We need to even do less. And what we need to do is those things which come very naturally to us. Those things which we don't have to think about, we don't have to reflect on, we don't have to force ourselves to do. What is instantaneous, spontaneous, easy, simple? And again, this is not a deep, I mean, it's a, I think it's an important, significant idea. It's not complicated in any way. I was driving to the hardware store the other day, and I ended up at the coffee shop. <laughs> because that's where my truck knows to go. <laughs> and and I, I wasn't thinking, you know, my mind was doing that. And just, what do I do spontaneously? I arrive at the coffee shop. And so since I was at the coffee shop, I thought, well, I better go in the coffee shop. Because <laughs> there I am. It's just spontaneous, it's just natural. I don't mind going to the hardware store, I'd much rather go to the coffee shop. <laughs> you know, what comes easy, what comes naturally, those things that we do automatically without thinking about, Taoism says, well, cultivate that. What, what interferes with what comes naturally, what comes easily? It's probably unnatural. It's certainly not the Tao, because again, if you watch a rock for a long time, it never does anything unrock-like. <laughs> it really doesn't. I know, again, it sounds odd, but, but watch. Trees rarely do weird stuff. I think, I can't believe the tree did that. <laughs> Right? And if, you, and if you watch, and the thing, I know it sounds funny, but I want to give you an actual exercise on this, which is straight from the Taoist tradition. I've done this in classes before. Pick a bush, a rock, a tree, something that you pass every day, like at your front door, someplace that you go all the time. And just do these three simple things. When you pass it in the morning, say good morning to it. At some point during the day, Try to think about how it's doing. And in the evening or in the afternoon when you come home or when you're moving back, say good evening, good afternoon when you pass it. That's it. Run this experiment and see. My students have reported amazing things. So slowly, or actually not as slow as you'd think, I mean, in a couple of weeks, that thing starts to become alive. And, and the two stories I like to tell is one of my students, she, she said she was she had done this for a couple of weeks, and there was a rock out in her yard that she did this to, feeling completely silly and stupid. And she said then one day it was raining and kind of cold, and she just, as soon as she got home, she went and built a little hut over the rock. <laughs> she said she didn't think about it. She just went home and just built a little hut over the rock because all of a sudden, and then you realize, she said, it looks like all the little huts over all the rocks and trees that you see all throughout the world that had come alive to her. All of a sudden, she started feeling, resonating with the natural world in a way she never had. Another student, he reported back that he was fighting with his girlfriend out in front of his apartment, and she storms off and got in her car and drove off. And the bush that he had been talking to started laughing. He said he heard that bush. He said he swore. He says, I heard that bush laugh at me. And I turned around and looked at it, and it was very quiet. <laughs> and he said, I, it's a true story. He said, I was so shamed by that bush that I realized I was just being an idiot. And I, I went and apologized to my girlfriend. Because I, I was the bush had just said, look. Right, he just, he just, the bush just laughed at me. And I knew the bush was right. <laughs> the bush was right. The bush and the rock will always be right. So the, the, this notion of a living 
natural world that really has something for us to learn from. To teach us to be like a stone. That's why I think that's such a perfect quote from Sartre. But what we do mean to say that man is of greater dignity than a stone. You will never be greater than a stone in Taoism. It is impossible. It truly is the most dignified thing. Because it is this pure expression of the Tao, and you can't get better than that. And so these concepts like Wu Wei come in, and we think, oh, well, non-action, action, non-action, several different ways to think about it, but none of them are particularly paradoxical, and none of them are particularly subtle or difficult. What can I do without doing it? Essentially, this runs counter to everything we've ever been taught. Listen to everything about it. Environment is a great one, because every solution to the environment involves us doing something besides, for instance, not using so much energy. Let's just not use so much power. Hmm. Nope. Electric cars, hydroelectric, hydrothermal, solar, you, you know, clean coal, whatever the hell that is, you know, <laughs> fracking, you know, nuclear, fu fusion, energy, really, come on, people. Uh, you know, we're going to do everything except like, oh, use less energy. Not do something. That would be genius, but we're not going to do it. Because we know that you do things. So part of the way is to just say, look, ask yourself, what can I achieve without acting? What can I stall out? By the way, I always recommend this. If possible, stall shit out. <laughs> right? You must have done this where you just realize if I don't do anything, bad thing goes away. If I stick my hand in it, bad thing bites me. Right? Just, just you know. But we're terrible at this because I'm, and by the way, I'm the worst at this of anybody. I just, ah, I'm hyperactive. So I'll do something. I've got to do something. Got to get in there. No, no, stop. Time. Uh, Wu Wei. So, what can I do without acting? What do I do that just comes naturally, spontaneously? I mean, it, it, another coffee, actually, another coffee shop uh, <laughs> that I go to regularly, I go to all of them regularly, um, has a big pile of toys for kids, which I love, because I just love to see kids and they're having a good time. But you watch kids, they run over to the pile and they look and they pick one. And then they run someplace else and they start playing with it. What comes spontaneous? What comes naturally? What comes easily? What toy do we all love? Which one do we just pick up? We're given, our, given a choice. If we're flowing downhill like water, where do we land? Where do we end up? What do we do without thinking about it? But what we hear, of course, consistently is grit and drive and grind and effort and commitment, dedication and suffering and pain. Why? <laughs> Can I just play with the toys I like? <laughs> I like these toys. These are fun toys. No, apparently not. <laughs> we'll have none of that. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, we have, you have to take these classes. To be educated, you must take these classes. Whether you're interested in them, you like them, you're good at them, doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> hey, I'm really good at these classes. Can I take some more? No. <laughs> I'm bad at these classes. Yes, you have to take those. Why? <laughs> we don't know just because it's good for you, like eating Brussels sprouts. I don't know. It just, it, woo, woo way. So on one hand, it's a very simple concept. has some nice subtleties, but it's not complicated. It's not remote. It's, it's, again, what can you do without acting? What can you do that comes spontaneously to you, that is easy, effortless, natural? And how do I make more of that? Simple, not paradoxical. And yet, again, the, the comments on this will just drive you mad because it's, it's not that hard. Um, another example also would be diets, by the way. Um, apparently, the religion of the 20th century is the diet because we always have more and more and more and more of them, right? Which is why we keep getting healthier and healthier and healthier as a people. <laughs> Because more diets make more health. So that's not working. So why don't we stop with the diets already? We just go on a diet diet, as it were. Just swear them off. 
Everybody just eat the shit that makes you feel good and let's see what happens. I'm thinking it couldn't be any worse. I really am. But we can't have that. We're so messed up now that I think it, maybe it's impossible to even figure out what we would actually like to eat if we were allowed to choose. You know, that, but, but again, the notion of just keeping adding more, just more, do another diet, have another diet, do another adjustment to it, have another layer, another layer, layer more, must have, do, da, ah. It's always there, that press is always there for us. Um, uh, let's see, another parable here, which I love again. There was once a man in Sung who carved mulberry leaf out of jade for his prince. It took three years to complete, and it imitated nature so exquisitely in its down, its glossiness, and its general configuration from tip to stem, that if placed in a heap of real mulberry leaves, it could not be distinguished from them. This man was subsequently pensioned by the Sung state and rewarded for his skill. Lei Tzu heard of it and said, if it took the creator three years to make a single leaf, there would be very few trees with leaves on them. The sage will rely not so much on human science and skill as on the operations of the Tao. Lei Tzu. Now, right. Um, we have a smart building, our new building, which is lovely over there. They call it smart building. Smart building, very nice. How do you keep it warm in winter, maximize the sunlight, and keep it cool in the summer? Wouldn't it be great if there was something you could do that allowed light in in the winter and blocked light in the summer? Hmm. What would that thing be called? <laughs> Potentially a tree <laughs> that is deciduous and drops its leaves in the winter, ipso facto letting the light in, and then shades us in the summertime, thus cooling the building quite lovely, and about which we have to do absolutely nothing except perhaps plant a tree. No, that's not how you do this, of course. You put computerized control mechanisms, you have things that go up and down on the windows, you have all these feedback loops, all in the name of energy conservation and efficiency and environmental <laughs> friendliness. But we're not gonna plant any trees. We'll have no tree planting. Trees are old fashioned, right? So that, j just that simple notion, what can we let nature do? This is, the, this is the hilarity of this. Why carve a leaf? We have leaves. You're not going to carve a better one because it's impossible. So a skill, yes, but pointlessly applied in the wrong direction. If we didn't have mulberry leaves, very impressive. But since they did have mulberry leaves, and you don't even have to do anything to get them. This is the point. They're so beautiful. You can pick up, for instance, a stone on the beach. That is quite lovely. But you don't have to even do anything. Pick it up or even just leave it there and admire it in place. You must have walked along the beach and you see the water as it comes off the stones and this glistening. And it's just like a, like a field of jewels, right? This just endless expanse of just beautiful, glistening, colored stones. And I think... Our desire to have that says, oh, we want to get that jewel-like thing, bring it home with it, make it ours. So we must do something. I think what you must do is go on the beach and look at the beautiful stones glistening in the light. Right? That's the easy. How hard is that? Ah, but, you know, we can't get our hands on it. It's not enough for us somehow. And so he, so he talks about this. He says, you know, if, if the universe took three years to make a leaf, wow, we'd be really short on leaves. So don't do things the universe does automatically. And the things that the universe does automatically, just go with that. Because it's, it's easy. What, what does the universe do for us that, that is easy, simple, no problem? There it is, go there. Um, another ex example comes from, a, this is a poem actually from Jia Dao. Uh, this is the, I think, Lin Yu Tang. This is his translation, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, Seeking the master but not meeting, I asked the boy beneath the pines. He said, the master's gone alone, herb picking somewhere on the mount, cloud hidden, whereabouts unknown. So why is the master not there? This is one of those peculiar poems, somewhat elusive. 
But when you start pondering it from the Taoist perspective, the reason he's not there is someone is looking for them. That's a bad thing. It's just going to create problems. That, that, that if someone is out looking for you, to ask you questions and badger you, no. The Taoist master is always someplace else because he does not want to be bothered. Right? I'm, I'm up gathering herbs in the mountain. I always think it's actually the boy who is the Taoist master just lying. <laughs> I always think that is the real interpretation of this poem. Is the Taoist master is just standing there going, oh, he's, he's up over there. Some, I don't know where. Look, it's foggy. Can't see him. Could be weeks before he's back. Lovely to see you. Please go away. Um, yeah, so these, you know, these kinds of parables, because we think, oh, wisdom is supposed to be applied, and wisdom is supposed to make the world a better place. See, no world is as the world is. You do not make the world a better place. It's not your job. If you think it's your job, ugh, the Taoists think you're going to have a rough time of it. Knock yourselves out with that one, kids. <laughs> we'll be up in the fog in the mountains. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's perfectly clear. That, 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 you know, this concept of, of making, the, of doing something, being something, helping, being out in the world, doing stuff, which we can hardly avoid. We love this. I love this. I can't help it myself. I'm like least Taoist person ever. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it, but this can be applied in, in limited ways, right? At least to start small. How can I stop thinking I need to change the world? How can I stop acting? What do I want to do spontaneously? If you read the Tao Te Ching with these questions in your mind, I think it'll become much clearer because it's just, it's very, like I said, it's very clear. It's not that confusing of a work. Many possible interpretations, not one, but these questions will help guide you. Uh, there's another parable I wanted to use, but it turns out not actually to be a Taoist parable, but you may find this. It's often quoted as one. Um, but it took me a while to actually track down where this came from, and it comes from a friend of Carl Jung. And Carl Jung has quoted it so often and in various different forms that people then misattribute it as Carl Jung talking about some ancient Taoist parable. But it's not. It's actually a, sort of a modern Taoist parable that Jung liked very much, uh, I think for good reason. But the parable is simple and lovely. And it says that the, there's a village in China and there's been a drought. This is terrible, and everybody is going hungry, and they're worried they're going to die. And by the way, if you're in agricultural land, drought, bad, right? Everybody starves to death. And so they go get this Dallas master, and they say, well, will you come help our village? And he says, sure. And they say, you come make it rain. You're the rainmaker. He says, okay. And they said, okay. So he shows up, and he says, well, what do you need? And he says, well, I just want a little hut where I can sit for a few days and maybe garden. Okay, so they provide that for him and they're watching and every day he doesn't seem to do anything. He just hangs out in the hut, does a little gardening, hangs out in the hut, does nothing. So they're getting a little nervous and then the fourth day it rains. The fourth day it rains. And they're like overjoyed. And so they go to him and they said, what did you do? And he said, I didn't do anything. He said, I came and took the hut because I didn't feel well. I felt like my life was out of balance. Um, and now I feel better. <laughs> and this is often misinterpreted again as, oh, bringing himself into balance brought the world into balance. <coughs> this is not the right interpretation. The right interpretation is he did not care whether the villagers died in a drought or not. <laughs> He meant exactly what he said. He came and sat in the hut because he felt his life was not going well and that this would help him. And it did. The raining was just correlated, and that's lovely. Good for you. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Because I feel better. See, we, can't, we have to think that, oh, there's some message there where he brought himself into peril of the universe, the universe brought itself in with him, and then when things were harmonious, the rain came. That if we do well, good things happen. If you read the Tao Te Ching, it could be, nothing could be further from what it's driving at. You can do very well and get hit by a bus. We know this. We absolutely know that 
unjustified things occasionally, <laughs> once in a while, happen. It may not be a perfectly just world. I'm just saying. <laughs> and the message we tend to derive from this is we're doing something wrong or other people are doing something wrong. What we don't derive from this is the Dallas message, which is your, your, your theory and expectations of justice in the world are all messed up. Get rid of them. This sounds like quietism, an ethical retreat, because it is of the first order. Generally, Dallas were older men, sorry, generally men. Again, ancient China, not the most female-friendly land. Um, <laughs> who withdrew from the world. It was the withdrawing from the world that gave them the wisdom. They withdraw generally into nature, although the true Taoist master could be in the city and not disturbed, but you would never know he was there. That was the key. That's how you knew he was the true Taoist master, because you couldn't find him again. <laughs> right? That is the, it's, it's the, no, it's, I'm not making that up, because it would bother us. It's, it's the great Diogenes quote from ancient Greece, who, who, who I think was on the, the, the Taoist line a little bit, where he, he lived in a tub sort of naked all the time. And when um, Alexander conquers uh, Athens, he goes and says, you know, you are my great hero philosophically. I am the great conqueror. You just tell me what you want and I'll do anything for you. And he says, I want you to step aside because you're blocking my sunshine. <laughs> Right? Just leave me alone. Go away. I live in a barrel. I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, we can't, that's just not, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't accept that. And so it is this very strong counter to the impulse of Confucianism, which is to order the world, live by this set of rules, be directed by them, change and make it harmonious and human and livable. Again, like I said in the last lecture, it's a very humane message, one that we can understand, I think, and really come to grips to. Disagree with parts of it, but we can get it. Taoism says, just leave all that alone. Just let go. Just stop already. I mean, we're just driving ourselves crazy with all of this. Be ignorant. So the, the, the scholar learns something every day, the Taoist wise man forgets something every day. It's not hard to learn things, it's hard to unlearn things. Right? You must, we must have all experienced this where when, once you've learned something and then you have to you learn that you probably need to not have known that or to unlearn that, it's really hard to break that <coughs> mental habit or that thought and you just catch yourself over and over again lapsing into whatever the, the thing you had learned is. Yeah, the Taoist master forgets every day. Every day I forget something new. How wonderful. Until you're an empty boat. See, and again, we don't think, we don't go to school and say, all right, what should we forget today, class? <laughs> Everybody forget something. <laughs> but I actually think this was a great exercise. Make a list of just stupid shit that you've learned that you would love to get out of your head. Right? That just, just, if I could have just pitched that out of my mind, and if that had never been in there, how much freer would our thinking be? How much more natural would our response to the world be? How much more like ourselves would we be if we hadn't been trained into this, whatever, pattern of thought, way of being, type of motion? Right? How much do we need to learn and how much do we need to unlearn? Taoism, again, heavily emphasizes the unlearn. And as far as I can tell, we just don't believe that at all. <laughs> right? We always need to learn something new. Just like we need a new diet and we need a new source of power and we need some new weapons and we need some new cars and then things are going to be great. Because what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> See, so empty, empty that boat. Get, just throw as much overboard as you can. 
If nothing else, Taoism strongly suggests that we should examine closely the things we've learned and really say, do I, should I keep this? Ask a stone, for instance, would you keep this? <laughs> would you find this helpful? If yes, keep it. If the stone goes, you must be kidding, <laughs> then pitch it out. Because the stone knows. The stone knows everything that needs to be a stone. And like I said, we'll never be that great, but we can try, maybe. So, you know, that, this, this is what frustrates us with Taoism. You get this notion that it's this uh, opaque, uh, exoteric, um, you know, obtuse, difficult struggle. It, it, it really, I would argue, that it's not in its concepts. It just is in the fact that it tells us roughly the opposite of everything we've ever been told. You know, and, and that, you know, go out into nature to get healthy. I mean, sure, but no, just go, because nature, even if it makes you sick, go out into nature. This would be the Taoist argument. Your health is irrelevant. They suspect you're going to be much healthier, but that's not the point. It's not a utility issue. Stop with the utility. And in fact, one thing I like to think, try to work my mind around this, is to think all the stuff we do that is really totally unutilitarian that we love. That is just really daft. I have a hand coffee grinder. That's in house still thing, you just grind. Well, that's just ridiculous. You can buy pre ground coffee beans. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Joe at the coffee shop will grind them for me with a machine that will do a very much better job, more consistent, more even, much nicer than I can ever do. You can buy electric ones, but they make noise. I don't like the noise. Reesh, 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 reesh. I guess God ah, drives me mad. But it's certainly much easier. This is a completely irrational, pointless, not utilitarian approach at all. And, and I like it. Think of all the stuff you do that just isn't utilitarian. We can art, and think of all of the intellectual backflips we do to make it utilitarian. Oh, this, a sailboat practically pays for itself. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, you know, when you really think about it, you know, no, this is daft. A sailboat that we have, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. But they're wonderful. We love them. Many people do. And, you know, but I, so great. Why, is there's no, there's no, you didn't stop rationalizing. I think maybe one way to think about Taoism is just say, don't rationalize anything ever. There's no reason to, because it's not rational. It's not a reasonable universe. In, in a couple of years, the sun is going to expand and destroy all life in the universe, isn't that? I mean, in the, in the solar system. Is that rational? Is that reasonable? It is. So what's the utility value of that? Zero, I think, as, as far as we're concerned, not that helpful. <laughs> um, you know, but, but, but that's what's going to happen. So look at, and then rash on your own life. Really, does it, does it matter? Do you need to rationalize? Why are we always rationalizing? It says, well, you know, just, just knock that off. Um, <laughs> A couple of just two more quick points here, just because uh, I do. I think these course, the concepts are not that difficult. Um, part of what we get in contemporary culture is that Taoism, philosophical Taoism, what we've been talking about. I want to make a quick distinction between sort of the uh, uh, shamanistic traditions of Taoism that have grown into the I Ching, for instance, is, and and if you know Feng Shui, uh, is geomancy, right? Is is the arts of organizing things, gardens and houses and all that. So if you've ever seen Chinese gardens uh, and thought, wow, these are strange, um, it's because the intellectual approach they have to gardening is completely different than ours. I, I highly recommend this. I think the best ones around here are in LA. Um, they have a beautiful, large Chinese gardens, but they're just weird. They're weird to us because the way they're conceiving of how you interact with and what you're doing in a garden is so different that I think it helps to think about the fact that it's a different way of thinking when you can just inhabit it and go, we would never do this. 
This is not how we would ever build a garden. And they're amazing uh, uh, to spend time in. Um, and the, the I Ching, because I, I mentioned this last time with Confucius, is, is also with the Taoists, is this notion that fortune telling means something predicts the future, gives you guidance, uh, allows you to know, gives you insight into mystical processes. And this is why, in, which, is all, which is all bunk, right? Science will explain to you quite clearly that this does not work. The theory of the I Ching from Taoism is quite different. And if you read the I Ching, look at it, you'll see this uh, pretty clearly. What the I Ching says is, again, here's how the universe is. This, this is the way the universe works. It's the Tao. And so it does not give you passages like uh, don't make new friends today and beware of crossing long trips on water, right? These sorts of vague, like what? It, it, it says things like carefully weigh taking on new obligations because they may weigh you down. Does, I mean, you ask a question, it just, it just gives you just these sort of pretty good insights into life. And if you think about them for a long time, you might think, well, that is completely unhelpful and has anything to do with the question that I thought I was asking. But often you kind of go, huh, that seems like a good idea. Not in the specific sense of, oh, yes, definitely buy IBM stock, but in the general sense of, well, how do you think about problems? And am I thinking about this problem the right way? Here's a different way to think about the problem. One way to think about it is it's just a whole bunch of different ways to think about all your problems. You can think about it this way or this way or this way or this way. And if you have 64 different ways to think about a problem and you go through all of them, eventually you'll probably get some insight. <laughs> right? that, it, really, this is, this is it's, it's a machine for thinking. It's a pondering. It's like a, a, a big pondering box. <clears throat> Asking 64 very different people for their advice. What would you do? What would you? What, what would the stone do? Right? That just just running through that. Eventually, you go. Oh, that resonates. Oh, I see. The, oh, now the light goes. How often have you realized? People always say this. If I can just figure out the right question to ask, the answer is easy. And so this is what it has, this is sort of how it's focused. But again, it's a different way of of, of approaching the world. Um, so to come back around, uh, you know, what the Tao is not, I've been talking about what it's not, what's not, how to think about it, but it's a, a collection of, of not that terribly complex ideas, but that just systematically run counter to what we've been trained to think. And so we struggle mightily with them. Um, and so, like I said, I would highly recommend looking at Red Pine's translation of the Tao Te Ching, and, and just peruse through the, the, the <coughs> parables of Chuang Tzu and Li Tzu. They're probably the two most famous collections. There's many other ones. And ponder them, but try to ponder them from the notion of, you know, th th they're not trying to help me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care about me. <laughs> they really care about them, mostly. Right? And so it's tough to think about, but, but this is the core principle. What Sartre says articulates very clearly what we think and the struggle of the Western philosophical tradition. That's why he's a great philosopher. Our essence, our existence, its meaning, its source, how can we know about it? Taoism says, just forget all that. No, 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 and stop. We're done. You don't matter. We don't care that you exist. There's no reason to expect it has any meaning. Congratulations. <laughs> so just empty your boat and float along. Thank you very much, Dowd. <laughs>